Hey everyone, welcome. Uh, welcome to the importance of responsible AI in the games industry. If I could ask everyone to please silence your devices as our talk is getting started now. So hey, uh, I'm Shannon Leo. I'm a games journalist, uh, previously with the Washington Post. Now I'm freelancing for the New York Times, Vice, Verge. You can find me on a newsletter. My substack is shannonleo.substack.com. Um, today we're going to be dive diving into the topic of Microsoft and AI, which is extremely relevant to our times, uh, especially this year. That's all anyone can talk about is AI. Um, you know, um, 10 years ago we were wondering, is like AI Skynet? Uh, is, it, is it dangerous? And uh, this, this time around, it's all this generative AI and new technologies and how we're going to utilize those. So this talk will go over um, a lot of those concepts we're going to learn from some of the brilliant minds uh, at Microsoft. Uh, that can get into more of those details soon to come. And can we get started with uh, Kate? Can you introduce yourself and we can go down the line? Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kate Rayner, she, her, uh, VP Technical Director at The Coalition, one of our Xbox game studios. I oversee the engineering of the Gears of War franchise, and I'm involved in game-focused technology initiatives across Xbox including uh, engineering that touches many of our games, working with groups such as Microsoft Research, Microsoft's Gaming AI Group, and looking at the application of AI in our titles. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Klutz, he, him. I work in Microsoft's Office of Responsible AI, where I lead its sensitive uses program, uh, where we do a lot of product counseling and policy setting internally uh, for our teams across the company, uh, as well as um, develop materials and resources and, and enable uh, our Microsoft employees across the world to not only understand what responsible AI means to us and our responsible AI principles, but to put them into practice in our products and tools and services. Hey everybody, I'm Haiyan Jung, uh, General Manager of Gaming AI at Xbox. Uh, so my role is to really help Xbox think about, hey, what's our AI strategy as we enter into this new phase of foundation models? And also to look at our AI innovation roadmap and to start creating, incubating net new ideas, uh, leveraging uh, new AI technologies. Great. So everyone here has a different specialty. Um, you know, you all do different things at Microsoft. And I'm really curious uh, to hear from all of you, you know, what is like something that excites you about AI? Like, what kind of gets you going in the morning and waking up? Um, and maybe we can start off with Hayan. Oh, hey, <laughs> sure. Uh, so what excites me about technology? Well, I have to say, since I was a kid, I'm kind of a technology optimist. Um, I remember in the early 90s sneaking on to the internet through my dad's university account when all the web, all the internet was just text-based and just like making friends on the internet, which I don't know at the time I was a kid, so maybe um, we would rethink that these days. But just thinking about sort of, hey, how our lives have changed with uh, the, the internet, with the World Wide Web over the last 30 years, and now with AI, um, really kind of exploding in terms of its capabilities, how we as a society can, can be at this point and shaping how AI evolves over time from this point forward, just like we did with the internet, with the World Wide Web, working together to ensure that it is created in a way that brings value uh, for all of us in society. Uh, Danielle, what about yourself? Yeah, so I, I work across many different industries and organizations within Microsoft, including gaming and Xbox. And what excites me, similar to Haiyan, is just seeing these new capabilities and, and the innovation and ingenuity across the company and, and developing AI-driven products and services for novel use cases or to address problems. Um, but at the same time, I'm also excited about, given what I do in Responsible AI, that uh, because AI has really entered the mainstream the last year or so, uh, responsible AI has as well. And so not just talking about responsible AI, but, but operationalizing that, putting it into, putting it into practice and, and educating people and seeing the, that, that uptake uh, across the company and, and even in society more broadly about what that means uh, excites me. Okay. Yeah. 
So um, I've been making games since the late 90s uh, in the AAA space as a software engineer and a technical director. And you know, over this time, I've seen technology really transform the way we make games with you know, the advancements in high-level languages, sophisticated tools, modern game engines, uh, you know, modern game services. Um, really, today, an indie game developer um, you know, can, can take on the ambition of what a AAA game team did uh, over a decade ago. And you know, in the AAA space, uh, these games today, they are continuing to get more advanced. The bar continues to be raised, as it always has in game development. So, you know, I'm really excited about the potential for AI to augment the creative process, to augment creators, really power tools for creators and game developers to enhance their craft. Um, you know, in the online space, you know, we've seen games from sing go from single player to multiplayer to massive online connected communities. So from an AI perspective, I'm really, you know, excited about the potential to improve multiplayer games, to make them uh, more fair, uh, more balanced, and online spaces becoming less toxic. Got it, got it. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I came to GDC this year is to, you know, hear more about AI, which is what everyone's talking about. And I, but AI has been mentioned over the years continuously, right? It's, it's always a hot topic and, and now more than ever, but is it all just hype? Is it all just buzz? Like now there's ChatGPT and other like language models. Um, you know, is AI really worth the hype right now? Like why is it coming up now in the conversation? And maybe we can start off with uh, Kate again. Sure. Um you know, there's really been a confluence of things that have caused a step change uh, in terms of, you know, the excitement and the potential for AI that we're seeing today. We're really in a moment, and, you know, it's a big focus, and there's a lot of talks here at GDC talking about, you know, AI and machine learning. Um, you know, while there has been this step change, it's not, you know, we've been in this space for over a decade. If you look at past SIGGRAPH talks, GDC talks, uh, you see the application of machine learning, and AI across a wide range of fields, right? Graphics, animation, uh, business intelligence, hardware, of course, natural language, and, and of course, game AI uh, here. Um, you know, game teams have really been building their capabilities with machine learning. You know, it's seen now as more just another tool in our toolkit for creating, uh, creating games. Um, you know, the models that we see today have been, you know, advancing but it's really the exponential curve uh, in terms of the abilities of these models that have really, I guess, caught us you know, by surprise. It's really sort of the power of the exponential is really is what, where we're seeing all this sort of emergence. Got it. Um, anyone else want to take that? I'll just say, I think Hayan may want to speak more to this, but yeah, I mean, similar to Kate's point, uh, model innovations, architecture, compute, infrastructure, um, I think all of that has come together in this moment that we're having. Um, but to your question, Shannon, do I think it's a moment in hype? No, I, I think we are um, at a point where we have this step change and it's gonna continue to accelerate uh, in, in innovation. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to add that, um, as Kate was saying, over the last 20 years, we've been uh, working with AI and machine learning in many places across the Xbox ecosystem, in video games, so things like uh, AI driver tars in Forza, where uh, you can have a bot that emulates a player driver so that uh, you can play with your friends even when they're not online, um, or things like uh, skills ranking, matchmaking, are all driven by machine learning uh, models that we've created at Xbox. Uh, and so what's very interesting is that with the uh, ability to train these large uh, foundation models that uh, sit in the cloud, such as GPT, uh, I think we can start thinking about AI as a platform, that uh, a single model or a number of models can act as a platform for us where we can build tools on top of those platforms. Um, and so... I, I want to emphasize that, you know, I don't think we should talk about AI for its own sake. What we want to do is say, hey, what new problems can AI solve? What new tools, what new ways can AI enable all of us as game creators to express our creative vision uh, uh, on the screen? Yeah, um, I want to dive more into, uh, you know, gaming and AI because that's what we're all here for. 
Um, I, was, I find that topic really fascinating. Uh, I want to hear more about the Forza and also, you know, Gears, of course. Um, but maybe first we can talk about uh, if, if you're implementing AI uh, in, in all your tools, uh, what, what are some of like, those challenges that you might be facing? Um, anyone can take that question. So, you know, when I think about, you know, AI, um, I really think about it as a tool for development, really sort of power tools to that augment developer um, abilities. So, um, you know, I think of, uh, you know, just programming itself and just the act of writing software. There's GitHub Copilot, which is a GPT-based model that is a programming companion that you know, we can use to save developers time and effort through code snippets. And, and you know, we use this really to kind of stay focused uh, you know, in the task and really spend less time on you know, repetitive and mundane coding tasks. You know, power tools for artists. You know, we use digital content creation tools today, uh, DVCs, um, to you know, help create the digital content in our game. You know, AI could be applied to really augment these tools and really be sort of art directable power tools for, for artists. Um, you know, I think one of the areas that um, is really interesting is increasing our test coverage in games. Uh, you know, our QA teams uh, have been using scripted automated bots for, uh, you know, testing for decades. Uh, you know, they've been exploring and embracing AI tools to see how it can empower them to do more. Um, you know, as a game developer, we're always trying to get more test coverage in our games. We're always trying to increase the frequency at which we're testing our games. So, you know, having these tools can allow us to really expand the amount of coverage uh, versus sort of reduce the test load on our, our test team. Um, you know, we never ship games without bugs. Every game ships with bugs, and really a big part of what we do is uh, just finding as many of them and fixing as many of them, and so really, I think you know applying AI in this space can really improve the quality of games um, uh, and support our QA teams in the way that they need. Yeah, I feel like that lends itself to like a natural question of you know does that um, take QA testers like put them out of their jobs? Or? No, I mean yeah, you know as I, I said, I see it really as you know a lot of the, the more uh, sort of mundane and difficult tasks, um, you know. AI can be used to, to, to do this, but what I have on our teams is our QA team is sort of working with us and asking us how can they use these tools to improve their test coverage to get more, uh, to get more coverage. Um, you know, I, like I said, like we're always trying to test more and get more coverage. Um, you know, we use the example of like you're playing a game, once you ship it, uh, you may have had only a few hundred people involved in the creation of that game or less, and then when it goes out there, there are millions of people playing the game, so they're going to find all the bugs, right? So having tools that can kind of simulate that and help us and, and amplify so we get more test coverage is really where I think the power is uh, versus sort of reducing the, 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 the test load. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to hear from Haya on this too, like well, how does this apply to Xbox? Um, well, so I work very in a very complementary way with Kay uh, in that, I, I sort of go visit studios and I say, hey, uh, what sort of custom AI models and algorithms are you working on? Because I, we have a fundamental belief that uh, AI it, for games is best uh, innovated with and within the game studios. And sometimes that's about starting things from scratch, making very custom tools for that particular game, that particular studio, because we know every single game is really different. And um, before we get to tools, we want to make sure that uh, each studio is able to realize their vision. And then we want to sort of abstract up and say, hey, could there be a set of tools that supports more uh, game creators across the industry? So we're really using Xbox Game Studios as a test bed to think about new tools for the entire industry. So yeah, thank you, Kate. <laughs> I'm, a big, I'm a big believer in that, really. Like yeah. Any technology that you see built, like building it with a game team where they're solving real problems, they're exactly. ensuring that what's being, you know, being created actually adds real value right, right, for their right. team, yeah. for their game, and for their players. Yeah. And then, you know, once you prove something out there, uh, then it you know, can go more places versus just creating something sort of general that doesn't really quite work for, everybody, for, for really anybody at that point. Right. 
And, and with these foundation models, uh, things like GPT, ChatGPT, I think we're seeing some exciting uh, prototypes um, exciting hacks on, on Twitter, on social media, where people are uh, taking the APIs and, um, you know, integrating them. We just saw uh, someone at Unity um, just added a, a little natural language text box to Unity. So you could say, hey, uh, create a, squ a block for me and, and a block pops up in, in your Unity engine. So we're seeing all this kind of... Um, uh, resurgence, this like, exciting um, uh, prototyping happening. And I think how we want to measure ourselves is eventually, how is that going to impact the quality of the game that players get to see in front of them? I think there's still a, a ways to go from this early excitement to tools that actually make it super easy for devs to create quality games. And as Kate talked about, you know, leveraging AI for quality assurance, for thinking about uh, character creation, content creation. Uh, there's a lot of innovation to be done, and then there's a lot of tool building to be done. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I would love to hear like more examples of like what you're seeing in AI and gaming and just kind of like dive deeper into like some of the exciting things that are that are happening because um, I mean, it, if you're saying it's not just hype, then, then there must be like things that you're seeing out there right now. Um, sure, yeah, sorry. So, um, you know, we've seen examples of AI, um, you know, quite publicly, like AI models being trained to play as competitive AI and like, you know, bigger kind of multiplayer games, professional gaming. Um, you know, I think you look at these as a game developer, uh, these techniques can be adapted uh, really from the pro gamer and really applying it to kind of Joe Gamer or Jill Gamer to provide sort of more balanced games, AI assisted onboarding for everyday games and really just matching different skill games. Now whether that's you know, AI for playing in a multiplayer match or companion based AI or a team based AI backfilling people that are leaving matches so your game can continue. I think there's a, there's a really interesting space there in terms of augmenting gameplay, gameplay with, with, with AI. Uh, you know, the drive guitar example of AI proxies, I think is a great example of an AI that's sort of trained off your play style and then creates um, a proxy to the way that you play. Um, you know, we've been using uh, AI through True, uh, True Match, which is a, a multiplayer matchmaking technology that we built at Microsoft that dynamically adjusts matchmaking based off your location and your skill um, uh, using you know, an, an AI model. And I think another really Good example is uh, voice chat. You know, we have voice chat in our game. We use as their PlayFab party, and what it does is it it has um, your know, voice to text uh, conversion, so real time voice to text conversion makes it more accessible, makes it more open. But also through Azure Cognitive Services, uh, it can do loca localization in real time, right? So where you end up is almost like this sort of you know babble fish, you know, like to quote a, a, a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy sort of reference where different communities can all communicate each other regardless of what their native language is. And uh, I think that's really powerful. Um, so I just want to build on what Kate's saying. And also, we are in a room of game creators, and I want to inspire everybody here to say, hey, AI creates this amazing opportunity for us to uh, make our games more accessible and inclusive so we can reach more players. Mm -hmm. We estimate there are 3 billion gamers in the world, 3 billion. And 400 million of those, we estimate, are gamers with disabilities. So how can we all use now the power of AI to make our games more accessible, perhaps through language? So how can we enable uh, players from different cultures to talk to each other in a seamless way? How can we make sure that our games can be played uh, by players with differing abilities who coming along and can play in an, in an even playing field? Um, uh, so I think there's, there's huge opportunity and also highlighting that as you think about leveraging AI to open up the accessibility and inclusion of your games, um, that we also encourage designing, creating with the community rather than for the community. So how can you engage gamers with disabilities in your creative process and um, really create sort of new breakthrough AI ideas? I, I love that point. And I, I just want to add one thing here. Um, this, well, a couple of things. One, the discussion you were having a moment ago about 
AI is sort of innovation and development arising from the game studios and how it uh, applies for gamers and users. And, that, and that's really tied to a key concept we have across all of Microsoft uh, and our AI principles and, and, and so there's the notion of accountability and, and in particular, designing your and developing your AI system so that they're fit for purpose. So that yes, you wanna generalize and abstract up as much as possible to, to gain efficiencies, but also you, you do need to think about your application space and your use cases. And how does the AI system that you're developing and the, and the tools and perhaps risk mitigations you're layering into that apply in your use case. And, and it's not always a lift and shift from one application to another. Um, and when you ask about pain points that developers have, I see that quite a bit in trying to sort of instantiate that mindset of, okay, this may have worked here. Let's see, let's take the pieces where this idea or these mitigations that we put in place worked well, but we really need to measure and test and evaluate for our use case. And then once we release a game, in, in this case, uh, how do we iterate and keep refining? Um, so I think that's that's super important in, in any kind of AI development. Um, and then on the inclusive, inclusivity uh, piece, another thing that I come across is trying to expand the mindset of who our stakeholders are when we're developing a, a product or a game in this case. And so, yes, you want to think about your users and your gamers, but in some ways, those who aren't your users, who are not your users or your gamers, uh, you, are, are just as important. Um, one, to bring them in and make them become your users, but also to think about the effects that uh, your product may have on them, whether that's um, civil society organizations, for example, um, underrepresented communities who maybe aren't in your space yet, um, but could be. Uh, and then, of course, thinking about the, the broader policy environment and, and, and uh, regulations that may come into play um, and, and always having that as a baseline as well. Got it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's, uh, there's so many different topics that you all touched upon right now that we can go bring this conversation to many different directions. But, you know, since we're at the Game Developers Conference and I'm assuming you're, you're talking to developers that, you know, are also interested in building an AI, um, but they're not working at Microsoft and they don't have the kind of resources that you have, uh, what would be some sort of advice that you would give them and like, help them along if, if they're interested in this kind of work? And uh, let's see. Um, yeah, any one of you could take this. But feel free. Um, sure, yeah. So, you know, I think, um, you know, this is a pretty active kind of broad topic right now. There's actually quite a lot of talks at GDC talking about, um, you know, AI development as well as accessibility, which we were talking about. There's a whole uh, series of, of talks there. And so, you know, there's a lot of material out there as, uh, that you can uh, learn from from other game developers. I think also there's, uh, there's training that's out there you can go on. Uh, of course, there's LinkedIn, there's, there's machine learning and AI training courses that are out there uh, that, um, that uh, you can uh, you know, reach out to kind of learn this sort of craft in these different technologies. Uh, Microsoft has a, its own Azure AI platform that you can, uh, that you can you know, go to the website there and there's a whole sort of learning path there and you can see the capabilities. And then you know, look at, you know, is this something that might be interesting to you? Um, you know, really, so as I said before, this has become kind of an essential tool that we're seeing show up, showing up in so many different parts of the high-tech industry and, and, of course, gaming now as well. And so building up some of that expertise on your team becomes like another domain specialty. And I think, I think it is important to have some of the knowledge of how to, these models are created, how to develop them, how to tune them, how to make them... Um, uh, um, you know, work well for your your game and your players. Um, and so building up that capability, uh, I think is really important. There are whole computer science sort of, you know, specialties on machine learning and AI development that, that are out there now. So there's lots of resources, I think, to, to look for. Plus one to what Kate said, and I'll just add a few other things. I think interdisciplinarity is more important now than ever. Uh, diverse backgrounds, skills, life experiences, bring those into the development process, talk to one another, learn from one another, have that sort of growth mindset to constantly be learning and have that humility to say, I don't know all the answers. Um, I'm gonna learn from others. I'm gonna learn from this 
budding community uh, and, and in my space of responsible AI. Um, to Hyann's point earlier, don't treat AI as a, a, this sort of monolithic thing in and of itself. There's a whole ecosystem of people's resources and tools that are code, being co-developed uh, right now and, and use those to help you along the way. So developers often come to me and say, look, it's not that I don't value response way, I don't value fairness and accountability and all these different concepts. Um, these are high level. How do I make them work for me? Um, what are some tools that I can use? What are some resources? Um, at Microsoft, we've open sourced quite a few uh, responsible AI developer tools, um, learning guides, resources, as well as our responsible AI standard, which think of as that as like the responsible AI playbook from an internal governance standpoint that we set for the organization. We've released all those publicly. You can see those at uh, aka.ms slash RAI. Um, for the developer audience, there's a ton of tools in there. There's a whole responsible AI toolbox, which integrates various subcomponents and other tools to assess uh, for errors uh, that you may have in your data and look at uh, sort of uh, disparities across demographic groups that you may have in, in um, your systems or tools to help leverage um, privacy preserving techniques when you're working on, on data and the like. So I encourage you to check those out um, and, and just get connected with one another in this community of, of, of people around the world working on this um, because you're not alone and it's super important and, and there's all kinds of great resources out there if you just learn where to look. Um, so start there and, and there's a whole list of resources that we have as well to help. So uh, I think to build on uh, what uh, Daniel and, and Kate have been saying. So I, I'm gonna advocate for three things that we do with all the game developers that I talk to. So number one is starting with people. Uh, great ideas come from your insights about players and about developers. So if you have ideas, hey, here's a, here's, might be a great play experience, it all derives from your insights, and that could come from observations, from talking to players, or if you have an idea about, hey, here's a developer tool I think might be really cool, talk to your development team, talk to other developers to see. Um, it needs to come from uh, working with people and, uh, and your uh, deep knowledge of what people really need. Number two, committing ideas to code. Um, I'm a big advocate of prototyping and experimenting and exploring uh, with an interactive prototype. And this is really important now with AI models because uh, especially with these foundation models, some of these behaviors, you know, with ChatGPT, you see on Twitter people saying, I discovered ChatGPT can do this because these models now have these emergent behaviors that we need to undertake this journey of discovery. Can the model do this? We're not sure, let's try it out. So we can describe the idea, but I really advocate playing with the model, committing uh, committing your idea to code. And it's made super easy now because uh, coding with GPT is as easy as writing natural language prompts, right? Um, so as Kate and Daniel said, there's lots of resources online. Um, we've worked very hard to make these APIs uh, democratically available to people. So signing up, I know there's a wait list, but signing up and, and getting access to those. And then the third, uh, pieces, responsibility and safety at the heart of everything we do. Um, I think another emergent behavior of these models is that we prompt the model to do something, but some behaviors, you know, we're just discovering um, and they may not do things that we expect. So always think about uh, our principles, um, our principles around data, around uh, outputs. How do we ensure that our model is outputting in a, a really safe way for our players? And uh, as Daniel talked about, our responsible AI toolkits can help you do that. <clears throat> yeah, I know. Now we're finally getting to the heart of this talk, which is, you know, how, how are we going to keep AI responsible? Um, I'm, I'm really curious, uh, you know, if people are feeding AI, yeah, all kinds of data across the board, and you can't really control it. How do you make sure the data is safe, or you know that the AI is not outputting something uh, terrible, or you know making romantic overtures to you, or, or something uh, off the cuff that you were not expecting? Uh, maybe Daniel, you can start off. Sure. Um, look, I, I I try to reframe that question a bit and say, well, it was sort of inherent in your question, I guess, when you say, how do you ensure that? the outputs are aligned with what you want to do. And that's a little different question than 
just the data. The data is a piece. This is a, a, a stack that you're building, as, as you all know. And so there are risk mitigations and responsible AI types of approaches you can take at every layer of the stack. So um, that's working with your training data, uh, trying to prune out data that you don't want to have in there. Um, but it's also developing um, mitigations at every layer, right? So at the application layer, there's things like um, content filters, for example. The UX and UI do you develop that's user-facing, super important, right? Disclosures to the user so they understand uh, the probabilistic nature of AI systems, for example. Um, and, and then also just the overall governance approach you take to feature and, and game development. And by that I mean, you know, uh, documenting how you're testing and evaluating your systems. Um, bringing in people who may not have been involved with heads down on the game development to adversarially test your system, right? Red teaming and the like. Um, to, to really really stress test those systems and, and try to identify some of these emergent behaviors that um, may surprise you pleasantly, they may not surprise you so pleasantly. Um, but you don't know what you don't know and, and it is so important for those diverse views to come into play there. And then as you're getting ready to ship a product or a game, you know, having, a, having a, a process in place where it's easy for users and gamers to give you feedback. So not only in the pre-ship pre process, um, to Ian's point, uh, you know, nothing for us without us, uh, also post-launch, um, understanding what your users are, are, the feedback they're giving to you and, and having the ability to act on that and constantly iterate. Oh. Do you, does anyone else want to add to that, or, or you think uh, you're, you're covered? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to add, you know, onto this. You know, the act of creating games is a is a human kind of created, uh, sorry, a creative and human centric kind of act, right? And when you're creating these AI models, you know, humans need to be involved in the process of creating them, testing them, and validating the models. Um, you know, you talked about sort of the full stack of like the data in uh, you know as you develop the model and then what you and then you know what comes out of that model you know just like creating a game we need to test it we need to validate it we need to get feedback on it we roll it out only once it's ready to be rolled out uh, but we may start small and then we may go larger um, it's really important to listen get feedback and then be able to have all the technical means to continually validate refine evolve roll back if necessary or fall back to other techniques. Just a lot of the best practices of just creating games in general then get applied to just how you should be creating uh, AI. But I think that you know, the most important thing here is that you need to include um, humans in the process, you know, diverse perspectives, diverse input, and, uh, and feedback to validate these models. Oh, do you want to you want to oh. jump in? Yeah, I I, I think you know we've talked about um, AI playing a role in uh, the game creation uh, process. Uh, we see that taking place in two different areas. One is um, development tools for your uh, your build time. So when uh, tools that help you as creators. Um, create content or um, just accelerate um, and empower you to do more at development time. So that's something that is within the full control of you as the creator. And then there's, um, I think you alluded to Shannon, more hype around, hey, AI in the runtime, dynamically embedded in the game. So the AI is generating the game as you play it. And I think the tools and processes involved in uh, making these two parts of the AI will be very different. So at development time, you as uh, the human creator, you can oversee what the AI is doing. At runtime, I think this is going to change how we think about games as a service. You know, it's kind of like AI games as a service. And uh, we, I think as an industry, have been uh, releasing games as a service. Now let's think about what new tools we need in uh, deploying AI in that runtime environment as well. 
I don't know what those tools are yet, but I think Kate will be inventing some of those. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really curious as to, you know, what you're looking at now, like what kind of like research you've done on, on AI, kind of things that you can share with us so, so far. I'm assuming you can't talk about what you're working on right now. I'll just I'll start a little bit in that. Uh, so my previous role uh, uh, in Xbox, I was in Microsoft Research in the UK, and I helped oversee the gaming and AI research portfolio. And uh, a lot of this work is published, so you should look online for Microsoft Research and and gaming. Um, uh, we had a, a, a huge body of work around using uh, technology called reinforcement learning and imitation learning to play the games for AI agents to jump into a game and to learn how to play the game and therefore become a companion player for you, to play co-op with you, to be an even more human-like uh, boss or enemy. Um, and so this is a really uh, research that we're very proud of. Um, and uh, it actually comes from a long history of AI research. You know, since the 1950s, computer scientists have been talking about, how, hey, AI is, um, to advance AI, we need to think about uh, how to create chess algorithms, AI chess algorithms that beat people. We've seen uh, Big Blue beat Kasparov in the 1990s. Uh, we've seen AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol. Um, uh, in, uh, if you've seen the Netflix documentary and more recently uh, uh, some open AI research where they created a, a team in Dota 2 that actually made it to the world championships for, for Dota 2. Um, so we've seen AI beat humans quite effectively and now how are we going to think about that in terms of actual AI in games to make them more exciting? Because nobody wants to be beaten all the time. So part of our research is how do we actually make AI a collaborator, somebody who helps you play the games? And how do we make AI um, shape its amount of challenge to meet the players where they are? Because that's actually what makes games fun to play. No, I'll, just I'll, I'll, just call, I'll just comment on that. Yeah. So, um, you know, in the example of like uh, an AI that's playing the game, uh, anyone who's been working in games like just over the past like two decades, it's really easy to make an AI bot that will just totally destroy you, right? It's really easy. It's just an aim bot, snap, you're done, right? Like it's creating an AI that plays like humans that can kind of adapt to difficulty uh, is a really nuanced, challenging problem. Um, you know, the idea here isn't to create things that are like pretending to be humans are just like if they're there in your game as a known kind of companion to help you out or to, to support you and your team. I think that's a really interesting space. Um, so yeah, I just thought I'd sort of you know, comment on that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I've seen it uh, both ways. Like I'll be called a bot in my league game because I'm playing so poorly, but then I'll like play against bots and they'll <laughs> defeat me. So I, I don't know, either way, it's uh, I, I, I don't really know. Um, I, I think yeah, it's just that the game is toxic uh, as a conclusion. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, like when you think of like toxicity in games, I think that's really a great opportunity for for AI. You know, like com combating cheating and in AI, I think uh, in games is really uh, an opportunity. So like for instance, mm -hmm. you know, an AI can be used to understand the play styles of like, what is realistic? You know, is this, uh, is this person like well beyond, uh, well beyond the bell curve? And then maybe flagging that, not, not to shut it down because you may just have a really awesome person in your game. Uh, it's really just to flag it so that your team can go and identify these sort of patterns and, 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 and individuals that might be cheating to then follow, follow up with sort of, you know, human, uh, human follow-up, um, you know, having cheating in a game uh, or having a game that's sort of hacked, right, with sort of known cheaters can really just ruin and destroy the reputation of the game. It's not a fun place to be. So I think AI can be part of a, a tool to help combat uh, cheating. Oh, no, oh, that's, that's, that's great. I uh, didn't expect you to remember that. That's a great one. Um, no, yeah, I'm also curious. So, like, uh, as we're talking about this, uh, we were also thinking about the, the people who have these kinds of jobs, right? Like they're the ones like spotting cheaters or they're the ones finding bugs. Um, uh, there's like the question of, uh, will AI steal human jobs? Um, I wonder, like, or the, what, what is the human impact of, of all this AI technology on, on humans? Um, and uh, I'm wondering if uh, maybe we can go around and maybe start off uh, with, with Danielle again. Sure, I mean, I, I think the, the key idea, and we touched on it here to me is AI as a tool 
is there to augment and assist, um, not replace. Uh, is it the case that AI is, is going to change industries at that macro level? I think the latest research out there says yes, indications are that it will. Um, but at the individual level, the intention here is not that it, that it replaces humans. Um, humans, the idea is humans are in control here, right? And, and is, it is another uh, technology that humans are building and shaping, um, and we as a society are reacting to those human-led developments. Got it. Um, so as Kate said earlier, you know, I think we all really believe that the art of making video games is a fundamentally human and creative act. And we see AI as empowering that, amplifying human creativity to give rise to completely new experiences that players haven't seen before and to open up the reach of your games to even more people around the world. And I think that is going to take all of us to take on that responsibility to say, hey, here's this new technology. How are we going to steer it all together towards making valuable contributions to us in the games industry? How are we going to work together? You know, within Microsoft, within Xbox, we uh, fully sort of, we published a set of responsible AI principles and we fully believe in those principles. And that's what we say, hey, we think we can help steer it by establishing a set of principles and following those principles around transparency, around fairness, around security. Um, and I want to ensure that this room also, either through reading about the principles we have published or through establishing, talking amongst yourselves and establishing your own principles in your studio so that we can all shape the technology together. Yeah, just to add, just to add on to that, um, you know, um, I've never been on a game team where we started off with, um, you know, uh, a full scope of what we want to do, and that's ultimately what we were able to do. Like, you always run out of time. You never have enough capacity. Um, and so I see really, you know, these AI uh, as, a, as a tool to amplify our creators, amplify our software developers, you know, amplify our ability to, cr to create these games. And so I see it more as us being able to raise our ambition. Like if you look at just the, the history of game development, how much it has driven so much innovation across so many different fields, your game developers will always continue to kind of push the boundaries and create more ambitious games. And of course that's at the AAA like top end, but also smaller development houses that wanna do want to be able to achieve more, you know, are always looking for advancements and tools to do that. So I, I see this as just raising the bar across industry. And the other uh, point that all of you uh, touched upon was accessibility and you know, diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, in the in the past, there have been studies or reports of um, uh, AI, uh, you know, kind of having like a racial bias or, or you know, recreating racial biases of humans. Um, how can you kind of make sure that like the AI that you're using in, in your tools and products uh, doesn't do that, like, you know, maybe like when you're making characters or other things that you're, you're mentioning. Um, if you wanna go around again, maybe high end. I can start. Oh, you can oh, start, okay. <laughs> go for it. Oh, sorry. sorry. You can... um, look, I think, you know, you, we, we, we've sort of hit on this throughout, but um, key, the, the, the core thing, the starting point is, again, to take in these um, diverse views, diverse backgrounds, and really understand um, what your sort of product truth is um, holistically, and, and then uh, go from there. I am a sociologist by training, a social scientist, so, um, you know, it, it is sort of fundamental to my core to, to think about um, uh, technology from a socio-technical lens, right? Um, now, the other thing I would say here is um, we need to be honest and, and sort of humble about the fact that, you know, there are going to be times when you may not be able to ensure that something uh, is going to go, uh, that nothing will go wrong. So ensure is a strong word, I'd say, and, and that's not just specific to bias or fairness issues. 
Um, so you're thinking about how to mitigate, mitigate, constantly iterate and refine and get to a point. And, and Tyan's point about principles, you know, you do have, you, you're principles driven. You need to figure out how you operationalize those principles. And I'll go back to the responsible AI standard at Microsoft, which I mentioned, which is just one approach to be, to be clear. Uh, but we have made it available to think about how you instantiate these sort of abstract principles into processes and into requirements that you have from an, from an internal sort of governance standpoint um, to, to build your technologies in a responsible way and release them in a responsible way. Oh, so I, I was going to say, thanks. I didn't know you were a sociologist. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also a lawyer, but I don't, uh, I don't tell people. Oh that, my so. goodness. Okay. Um, I, I think you raise a really great point, Shannon. Um, so I guess bias is a systemic issue in society. Um, and I, I kind of want to call that out. And I also want to call out that I work with some amazing colleagues, some of whom are sitting in the audience today, who help me review, assess, look at the products that we are creating through an accessibility and inclusion lens. And they have established uh, communities within Xbox that also help us do, do that and bring diverse voices to you know, look at everything that we're creating and saying, hey, are we addressing everyone's needs? Are there things that we are not sensitive to that is introducing bias that we're not aware of? And I think we all have to admit that there are biases that we are not aware of in ourselves. Um, and that's, I think, a starting point. So first of all, the bias in, that is systemic in everything that we do and having the processes in your studios to ensure that you have folks that are helping you looking at uh, your products through those lenses, uh, communities that you're tapping into to give you feedback. On the AI front, um, you know, I'm a big believer in uh, uh, understanding the provenance of your models. So when we say AI, AI is not just this monolithic thing. There are many, many models out there. There's open source models. Uh, there's models you can consume through APIs like at Microsoft or Azure or OpenAI. Understanding where those models are coming from because each model brings with it different training sets, different approaches, different outputs. Um, so it really evaluating where you're getting your models from um, and, uh, and holding those uh, those models or the, the creators of the mo those models accountable for being transparent, um, for giving you all the information you need to make the judgments about your product and which models you want to use. Oh, Kate, did um, you want to yeah, add? Yeah, I was just going to add like one <laughs> thing, just to kind of double down on a point you made, you both made. Um, you know, diverse teams make more inclusive products. And so really, you know, we should be following all these best practices, but including that diverse representation you have on your team is something you should be doing just as part as your, of your development practices anyways for the game you're making. And when it comes to AI and the application of AI in involving them in bringing their diverse perspectives um, into the development process. And if you don't have those individuals on your team, you should be reaching out to other groups to get involved in the development process. We have groups within Xbox, but there's also uh, plenty out there. And I think that's just something that is just really critical just for the act of creating game games in general. Um, you know, if you're not actively trying to be inclusive, you're inadvertently being ex um, excluding. And when you apply it to AI development, really including their perspectives in the feedback, the training, the validation and testing of, uh, of AI in your game. Oh, yeah, yeah, those yeah, are. And, and oh. I'll just add to uh, another point here uh, measurement and metrics. You know, we all can come to the table with our own philosophical views and sort of these passionate arguments uh, and, and all these competing interests um, that we may have in, in, in development of technology. Um, and it's not to say that measurement and metrics are objective either. Uh, again, a sociologist had feels compelled to say that, but it at least gives you a, uh, a common starting point. And so really being thoughtful about measuring for fairness types of harms or other types of issues and evaluating those so you can have some sort of uh, conversation where you're not all just taking each other as 
um, carrying your own sort of sub subjective um, biases, so to speak, um, in, in, in making decisions about how to develop and release technology. And it's just so critical to do that. Um, and it's something that should not be seen as a tax. It really is making for a better product. It makes for a better game. You know, it really does. Yeah. Um, uh, it sounds like you have all given this a lot, a lot of thought. So um, um, let's go to, to here. Um, great. And uh, let's see if there might be. Okay. So I think we have gone over this a, a bunch, but I think we can dive a little bit deeper into like AI and gaming. I would just love to hear more examples from, uh, you know, the work at Xbox, at the coalition, uh, in terms of like what you're doing with those games and, and AI. If you can just give us some examples of those and, and what is uh, interesting to you there. Sure. Um, so I can't talk about you know, our you know, future games and kind of what, what's coming down the pipe here, but I can talk about you know, some of the, the work that we've, we've already done. You know, I talked a little bit about uh, chat in our game and using um, you know, a, uh, accessible uh, real-time voice translation and, and, and uh, uh, speech-to-text um, you know, through um, a Zerp, uh, party chat, uh, sorry, PlayFab party chat. Um, there's the matchmaking tech that we have in Gears of War. Also, it's used in Halo. That is a, a true match AI algorithm. The paper is published out there. That um, you know can really optimize for skill, your location to a data center, and all the other factors to go into kind of optimize that equation. Um, really sophisticated, nuanced matchmaking is 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 actually pretty complicated to get right. Um, I think you know. Like combating toxicity is is one that I think we're you know we're doing today across Xbox. Like with, within the Xbox safety team, we have AI tools that we that we use to provide the the speed and breadth needed to support the Xbox community. So uh, it's a pretty complex task that requires human as well as AI uh, to really keep up with the pace of the amount of data that we're talking about, whether it be you know real time text, image, video, all these things that go into um, from our you know, players into the games. So there are tools like Watch4, which is a media analysis platform that you know, analyzes images, videos, and live streams in real time. Uh, uh, hundreds of millions of requests, billions of classifications each month that powers digital safety across the company. Um, and Community Shift is, is another tool that we use that's a human insights and AI-powered content moderation platform. Um, it's a scanning and classification system and a rules engine that lets us assess risk levels uh, in content that then community owners can, uh, can take that information to make uh, good decisions. Cool, got it. Yeah, um, I mean, while I still have all of you, uh, I also want to kind of uh, get back into um, more, more stuff uh, for da uh, Daniel. Just uh, I'm wondering, how do you kind of, um, you know, there, there are so many uh, images that come out of AI and some of them are, are fake and not real. How do you kind of validate that uh, uh, end product from, from the AI? Does it make sure that, uh, that you can tell what's real and what's fake, um, if you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, f f the term fake is a little bit contextual. I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm just trying to understand more where you're, com where you're coming from when you say fake. Okay, I'm trying to say deep fakes. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I got you. Uh, so, you know, I think there are affordances that you can build into your systems that try to um, mitigate the, the risk of that happening. I think also just being transparent with users and disclosing um, capabilities and limitations of your system is, is super important. Um, you know, uh, there are, there's no sort of, to me, in, in inherently bad uh, AI generated image. It's all about the use to which it's put, right? And so um, there are plenty of scenarios where an AI generated image uh, content would be would be useful and there are those uh, in, in higher risk domains or when uh, an adversarial or, or bad actor uh, wants to use them in a misleading way um, that, that you need to account for so um, you know I, I, I think that you, you really again come back to evaluating your systems and, and the purpose for which they're uh, intended 
right? And then you can you can use some of these tools I, I mentioned here and, and image classifiers and um, provenance, provenance detection tools, things like that, that um, can help in that space. Right. Yeah, so these are some of the questions that I had collected from, uh, you know, walking around uh, GDC and, you know, asking other folks that uh, really do spend a lot of time thinking about AI. Um, so that, that was a deep fake question. And another one for you is, you know, what does this actually mean for the average gamer? You know, the average gamer doesn't actually care about uh, cloud gaming or, you know, if, if a game is secretly on the blockchain or um, maybe they don't even care if uh, the game is using AI. But what, what does it change uh, for the average gamer's experience now that you're using all this new stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll speak to, you know, from a, you know, a typical gamer, I think, you know, as I mentioned, you know, these tools from uh, 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 for game creators to be able to take on more ambition will allow, um, you know, just better games, right? Better, you know, uh, more more games, more amplify the ability of developers to create, uh, to, to hone their craft and go to the next level. I would say, you know, on the other side, um, you know, the ability to um, get some of those capabilities down to our players, I think is really interesting. You have user-generated content, it's been around obviously for a long time, you know, these tools can be used for creators in our communities that are creating content that uh, supports the game or is ancillary to the game. For them to be able to take on more ambition with the content they're creating, I think is going to be kind of a future wave that uh, I'm pretty excited for. Uh, and then, of course, I gave the examples about more fair, balanced games and how, uh, you know, AI can help improve the player experience for gamers. Uh yeah, I, I think I sometimes I feel like we are we, we kind of live in a bubble because we, we talk about AI a lot with this group, but I'm sure amongst some of your teams as well. Um, and at the end of the day, it's all about the players and player experiences. So uh, as we talked about, I think someday we're going to see higher quality games through using AI tools. It may not be today. It may be tomorrow because things are just moving so quickly. But number one, Let's get to higher quality games. No player wants to open a game and have it be crashing, have there be bugs, missing textures. How do we get to higher quality games? Because that's what players are going to care about. Number two is completely new experiences that players haven't seen before. You know, leveraging the power of generative AI, perhaps. But think outside the box about the next game you're going to make. What is something totally radical that nobody's seen before that AI can enable you to create? And of course, ultimately, making more diverse games that uh, more players can play. Um, diversity of genres, diversity of uh, uh, the, the input mechanisms for playing, bringing a diversity of different people into your games and how can AI do that? And AI may be one set of tools that helps you do that. Um, so let us know how we can create those tools to help you, but also there will be other tools to get to those great new experiences. Yeah. Oh, did you have something? Okay, great. So, I, you know, our talk is coming to an end and we can kind of like close off. I think there's uh, a lot of things I've learned today from the three of you. So thank you so much for your time. Um, and, you know, in terms of like key takeaways, I could not summarize all the things you've said, um, but it's, it does sound like you are, you know, aware of like the the dangers and the, you know, kind of potential pitfalls of AI and you're like thinking very carefully about those while also, you know, trying to like share the knowledge with other developers. Um, so please remember to fill out the survey uh, at the end and about this talk and what you think of it. Um, I also let you like, if anyone wants to do some final words, um, but if not, no worries. Uh, it's been one hour, so we've been endured a lot. Thank you.